Good morning again. Welcome for joining us to continue in the Gospel of Matthew, especially a welcome to those watching online. Thank you for joining us, and we want to join you on the journey of faith as well, those who are watching from home or from other places other than here on campus. So if you would, definitely send us an email, reach out to us, and we will pray with you and connect with you the best we can. We're going to continue in the Gospel of Matthew. We're back there, and uh, we get into this. We've started it, and one of the things I want to say first is I love thunderstorms. Do, do you love storm? Well, I had one last night, actually a couple of them. I'm getting to bed for the second one, and all of a second I woke up with that thunder. Boom! Oh, hey, I like it. Yeah, I love those because, you know, even spending most of my adult life in Florida and growing up in Ohio, you go out during those times of the thunderstorm going out on the front porch and just watching it rain, listening to the, the thunder, seeing the lightning and that cool breeze coming in, and, and just love those storms. They Rain come and replenishes the earth, and it's just beautiful time. I enjoy those. But you ever been in a storm? Kind of know where I'm getting at with this question. It's got a loaded question, isn't it? You ever been in a hurricane, tornado, external storm of some kind? Yeah, everybody's saying yes. Monsoon rains, they're here. Finally getting monsoon and wetting the ground. Thunderstorms, tornadoes. You ever been in a tornado? Somebody's been in a tornado. I've seen them fly over. I haven't been in one, but it's like a little choo-choo train going through the sky. And it landed nearby. I haven't gone through that. A flood. I remember living in Louisville, Kentucky, and watching the Ohio River crest and how massive that crest can be. When they say crest, I'm thinking it's kind of going like, no, it goes out and it takes over. Ever been in a blizzard? Oh, yeah, some of y'all. And I, you know what? Some of y'all from California and you've been through blizzards from <laughs> Southern California? Wow. I mean, you know, earthquakes. Yeah, somebody said earthquakes. I didn't have that in my notes. I should have added that one. You ever been to an earthquake? Blizzard. I lived through a blizzard. I was wee little, but I remember it. I remember being out of school for a long time, and that was awesome. You know, parents couldn't get to work, though. And, and I remember one guy in his tractor trailer got caught for three days, was stuck. They couldn't find him. Yeah. That's what it looked like when they got him out. He said, I heard you walking over top of me. But you couldn't get your attention, so he rolled down the window, grabbed some snow, and eat. That's how he survived three days. They were able to clear the roads, though, so you can get downtown. And, uh, yeah. So blizzard, storms. You ever been in a hurricane? Yeah, me too. Category four. And if you know anything about hurricanes, they go up to category five. And I said, I'll never do that again. And God honored my wish because he moved me to Arizona. So I don't think I'll have to do that again. Right? Oh, hallelujah. So uh, you may not have lived through a hurricane, flood, or tornado, but I do know you've lived through a storm. Sometimes there are slow developing storms. Other times there's wham, hits you in the face. Come out of nowhere. Some are quick. Some linger and linger and linger and most won't go away. Storms of life are inevitable. Life transition storms. Some of y'all moved here from California. Or you moved from someplace. Moving, changing, establishing roots, getting jobs, new routines, college, kids going off to college, empty nests, kids are finally growing up and moving out, retirement, death of a loved one, life transition storms. Health-related storms, the big C, cancer. Maybe it's mental, dementia, Alzheimer's. Bad knees, you got arthritis. Bad elbow. You know, I go to the gym, I work out, and I, I, I just feel great. I come home, and I'm pulling goat heads out of the yard and tumbleweed, and I get tennis elbow. <laughs> I, I don't even play tennis. But for y'all, I got to finish it. I do raise a racket. You got that? <laughs> yeah. Some of y'all got that. You got to get the preacher some love. Come on now. Okay, laugh at his jokes even though it's dumb. Financial storms. Lose a job. Unexpected bills, car breakdown, 
house repairs. That's life, isn't it? Come on now. Wasn't ready for that to happen. Relational storms. Marriage issue, marriage problems. You didn't know there were some. Maybe you did, just ignoring it. Children, parenting, raising kids. Extended family, the in-laws. All storms in some way, they change things, don't they? They're life-altering. And it comes down to how do we respond in the storm? Well, what do we do in them? Because we all have questions when we go through these storms. Where are you, God? God, what are you doing? I know I need to learn something, so will you help me learn it quickly so we can get on from this? Let's get this quickly over with. When will it end? How much of this can I take? What do I do now? Are you trekking with me? Anybody? And here's the question. How do we navigate through the water when the storm rages around us? How do we navigate through the waters when the storm is raging around us? See, Matthew chapter 8 preached on Peter and how Jesus comes and heals his mother-in-law and Pastor Whitney came back with it on the cost of following Jesus. And we're continuing in that story. And, and Jesus says he sees the crowd and he's afraid of being distracted. And he says, we need to go to the other side. So backing up, just for a moment, this one verse, Matthew 8, 18. Pastor Whitney covered this last week. He says, now, now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go to the other side. And then he comes and encounters these people. So he's distracted because he gave orders to go to the other side. And this word for orders is exactly that. It's authoritative. It's giving direction. It's a commandment. Jesus said, we are going to the other side. And that's important for us this morning. We're going to the other side. And so after this bit of distraction when he's encountering these people, they finally get into the boat. And in 23, he's saying, you know what? Enough's enough. Let's get going while the going is good. We better start moving now. So let's go. I'm going to go take a nap. Y'all get this boat over to the other side. So let's pick it up there in Matthew 8, verse 23 to 27. When he got in the boat, his disciples followed him, and behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Father God, we thank you for these moments that we can turn to your word. God, we gather to hear from you that you would touch our hearts, our minds, give us ears to hear and hearts to receive as you have for us this morning. It's not about me speaking, it's about you, Jesus. So have your way with us this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, how do we navigate the storms of life? How do we navigate when uh, the waters, when it's raging and coming up on us? The first thing we need to do is this. That understand that storms come to everyone. Understand that storms come to everyone. No, you're not just being picked on. You're not being singled out. I think from when we talked about storms this morning, everyone has been through a storm, is in a storm, or definitely going to go into one, right? Isn't that the old phrase? You're either in a storm, going into a storm, coming out of a storm, and there's one on the horizon. That's reality. I haven't met a person yet who has not gone through a storm. Both sinners and saints, both God's people and those outside the church. Storms rage. Sometimes I feel we do a disservice to people as we witness to them, though. As we encourage them to come to, to Christ. As we, as the body of believers, we go to people who are going through a storm of life, going through a life crisis, and we tell them everything's going to be okay. Just come to Jesus. 
Sometimes we say, come to Christ, he'll fix your marriage. Sometimes it doesn't happen, does it? Come to Christ, he'll heal you. No, Jesus can heal you. But there are consequences of free will. God has a bigger plan. God sees things differently, and he heals differently, doesn't he? Come to Christ, and everything will be better. Well, what do you mean by everything will be better? We need to qualify that. Yes, we need to encourage people to come to Christ. Yes, we need to encourage them to turn to the Lord. Yes, because it is better with the Lord. You have the Lord's presence and power, his comfort and his peace, and we see him at work. And we can walk through trials, and we, and we can go through these storms and endure them with God's protection and peace and presence. But let's be truthful with people. Life still happens. There's still trials. During the COVID shutdown a couple of years ago, I was reading an article, and I filed it and came across it as I was preparing this message. It's by Greg Laurie. Greg Laurie is a pastor in California, and he wrote this article based on three types of storms that we go through. I want to kind of briefly share it with us. It'll help with us as we consider the storms of life. And so the types of storms, it says one is a perfecting storm. Perfecting in that God is allowing us to go through, and sometimes he causes us to go through things because he's refining us. He's growing us. He's maturing us. He's strengthening us. He's even preparing us for something to minister to somebody over something that's ahead. And so he's perfecting us. There's a storm that perfects us. There's also a storm that protects us. That's an interesting of saying, a storm that protects us. In other words, it protects us from something that could happen worse later on in life. So we would ask the question, why did that relationship end? God was perhaps protecting us from something in the future. Why didn't I get that job? Why didn't I get that promotion? Why did I lose my job? Maybe God was protecting you from something that's going to happen in the future. See, not only do we learn and grow, but God redirects our path through this storm. It's a detour in life. And then there's a correcting storm. Sometimes we bring storms upon ourselves, don't we? We bring it upon ourselves. And we can blame Satan all we want. Satan's attacking. Satan's doing this. Why are you Satan? I come against you, Satan. You know what it is? It's that we did something dumb. That's why we're going through that storm. God's correcting us. We can complain. Why is this happening? What's going on? Why is it happening? And you know what? We all know darn well why it's happening, don't we? The prophet Jonah was going through one of these kind of storms. Prophet Jonah was told to go to a particular city, and then he said, no, I'm not going to go there. And so a big old storm came up, and God was saying, let me correct your path with this storm. See, sometimes we just have to ask, what storm are we in? Is God perfecting me? Is God protecting me? Is God correcting me? Regardless, Jesus can stop the storm, as he did in this story, but he's always with us in the storm. That we can guarantee and believe. That is our faith that we need to embrace and hold on to. That Jesus can stop the storm, and sometimes he does, but regardless, he's with us in the storm and guides us through the storm. And so we need to recognize that God is there. Recognize God is there, but let's come back to this story here. The storm is raging, the disciples are trying to save the boat, and what's Jesus doing? He's sleeping. How can you sleep at a time like this? You ever met them people that can sleep through anything? You know, I'm wide awake because somebody's snoring, I can't sleep, I can't get back to bed, all this banging going around, and somebody next is just dying, he's sound asleep. One of my buddies in college or something, just, they sleep through anything. Nathan was wee little of this, he's 12 now, but 
there was one time when we were at, at a church on a Sunday morning and then Sunday night, and we lived in a church parsonage that was across the parking lot, and, and he's just out. He's in the pew. He's, he's sawing logs. So I pick him home, and I'm carrying him home, and he's getting heavy, and I just kind of lay him down in the front door as we come in. He's still out. He's not even moving. It, it, he, we could have gone on. He would have slept right there. And someone falls asleep when you need them or oversleep. You ever had that happen to you? Where are you at, man? I needed you. Oh, sorry, man, I overslept. <laughs> There's always one, you know. How about the guy who sleeps in church? Uh, yeah, I'm going there. Yeah, I can see uh, I got a good view of y'all right there. See, most of y'all are looking at back ahead. I see who's engaged. And the guy that's in the back, the proverbial guy that's in the back, and, you know, the, it begins with the eyes closed, the hands raised. See, they're just, yeah, you're worshiping. I know you are. Yeah, you're worshiping. Yeah, you're worshiping. All of a sudden, the head you know, you, you, yeah. And he's like, oh, praise the Lord, preacher. Sleeping. Hmm. Doesn't it seem sometimes like God is asleep? God, aren't you aware of what's going on? What are you doing? But he's there. He's not asleep. He's there and he's aware. Again, it comes down to how are we going to respond in the storm? What are we going to do about it? How are we going to react? What kind of faith are we going to exercise? You see, I, what I believe about this story is the humanity of Jesus, he's asleep. He's tired. The humanity of Jesus is asleep, but the deity, the God nature of Jesus is not. He's waiting for the disciples to come to him. Why and how do we know this? Because we have the testimony of Scripture. I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's what Jesus said, right? I will never leave you nor forsake you. So not just is he there, but forsaking is I'm aware of what's going on. Isaiah 43, verses 2 and 3. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Charles Swindell wrote this one time. Who of us has not longed for a word from God, searched for a glimpse of his power, or yearned for the reassurance of his presence? Yet later we realize how very present he was all along. He's there. See, if God seems distant, it's us, not him. God is there. And then we cry out. We cry out. And sometimes we cry out to the wrong stuff, to the wrong people, to the wrong thing. Sometimes it's not even crying out, it's just venting. There's a difference between crying out and venting. Sometimes we just vent and complain. That doesn't do as much good, does it? Yeah, maybe, okay, a little bit. But if we cry out to God and connect and cling to God, that's where we find our hope and peace. But see, we're a fix of people. I have to do something about this. I have to fix it. What, what should I do? And if I don't know what to do, you know what, I just Google it. You always find an answer on Google, don't you? It's the right thing to do on Google. Might show my age, but how about Dear Abby? Yeah, I'm old. I'm that old. Young people ask your grandparents about Dear Abby. And you, you just look for it on the answer. And you know, here's the thing, you have an ailment. How do I what do I do? How can I do this naturally? And, and have, everybody has these potions and these pills and drink this and do that and, and they'll fix it. You know what I think of Snow White and that witch who puts together here, drink this. Here, this will fix your problem. But how often do we buy into that stuff? We do. Just look at your symptoms if you're not feeling well. Look at it on WebMD. You know what the answer usually is? Go back to bed. You're going to be dead in six months anyway. I mean, uh, you know, I'm, you're dying. The book of Jonah. Back to that. These sailors encounter a storm, and Jonah's asleep too, right? If you know the story. And they're throwing cargo off. And they're trying to fix this. 
and they're crying out to their gods. And even when they get the answer, Jonah comes and says, it's because of me. It's me. It's my, I'm the fault. Throw me overboard. They look at him like he's crazy and keep rowing. And what God is saying, will you stop rowing? Will you stop trying to fix this? Come to me. Come to me. Will you just come? The disciples, they're professional fishermen. They probably tried everything. The text doesn't say that. But we can assume that they tried to steer the ship and get it going. And finally they went to Jesus. You can do more than pray. Have you heard this phrase? You can do more than pray after you have prayed. But you can do no more than pray until you have prayed. I'm not a prayer now. You can do more than pray after you have prayed. But you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. Cling to God. Cry out to God. And I love how clinging and crying out to God is portrayed and described in the Old Testament in Hebrew language. In the Hebrew language, it means to actually make a big noise. You're getting God's attention. It has the understanding of being persistent and consistent, not going away. It also has the word with it that you can say of accosting someone. Now, if you think of accosting someone, you're thinking of somebody's getting mugged, right? But how about that image in connecting to God? I- I'm going to come to God. I'm going to cling to God. I- I- I'm going to cry out to God. I- I'm going to be with God. God, I need you. And Jesus is saying, have faith in me. Believe in me. Trust in me. Turn to me. God hears the cry of a desperate people who turn to him. He hears that. And he runs to them. I think of the Exodus in the Old Testament. In the Exodus, the people of Israel are in bondage and slavery in Egypt. God raises up a deliverer, Moses. And how does he say it in the Exodus? I've heard the cry of my people, and I've come down to rescue them. I have heard the cry of my people, and have come down to rescue them. Jesus is asleep in a boat with a storm going on. What woke him up? When the storm, was it? When the disciples came and said, don't you care that we're perishing? Aren't you going to do something, Jesus? He heard that desperate cry of his disciples, and he was ready then to act. See, God, there's a terrible problem going on. There's trouble. God, I need you. I need your peace. I need your presence. I need you to hold me. I need your wisdom. I need your strength. God, help me. Cry out to God. Cling to God. Then understand that God has a plan and a purpose. God has a plan and a purpose. God is doing something in the storm. God is doing something through the storm. And maybe it's for those around you as well, not just for you, that they see how you respond to it because your life is on display for the world. Why are you so different? Why do you have peace? Why are you so calm going through all this? Because I have Jesus with me. It's a testimony. We learn, we grow, we mature in storms. But God also uses us to help us witness to those around us. I had a talk with the fam- my family recently and during some family devotions. Usually at the table we have some other rituals, I'll call them practices. We ask about each other's day. And then we retire when it's devotion time to the living room. This time, it just, God had it open up and we just stayed at the table. And I asked them a couple of questions and I prefaced them with this as I was thinking about this message. I said, sometimes God stops the storm. He does. I mean, that's obviously, that's what this story is about, right, today. He gets up, he stops it, done. There are also times when He doesn't stop the storms, but he walks with us through those storms. I'm thinking of the storm when the disciples are out and Jesus walks on water to them and calls Peter to come out. The storm is still raging, so he's walking with them through that storm. So sometimes he stops it. Sometimes he walks with us through the storm. And so I asked them, which would you prefer? 
if a storm came up in your life, would you rather have God stop it or God walk with you through that storm? Which would you have? And I also wanted to know why. All of them said for God to walk with them through the storm, not for God to stop it. So I asked why. Why why would you want it that way? Some of the explanations were I'd become stronger, I'd grow stronger, I'd feel God's presence, I'd be prepared to, to serve him later in life or to help someone else through that same storm. But then I followed up with another question. I said, what if that storm never ends? What if you chose that, to chose to walk with God or have, actually have God walk with you through the storms of life, knowing that it would eventually end, but it doesn't seem to ever end. It's going on, it's lingering on and on and on. Because the reality is God sometimes calms the storm, sometimes he walks with us through the storms, but we don't know when the storm will end. We don't. I want to introduce you to a young man I met now about eight, maybe ten years ago. His name was Logan. Logan played football at Pace High School in, outside Pensacola, Florida. He was in ROTC and had a goal of wanting to be a military man. He wanted to be infantry even and be a soldier. Good-looking young man. Short time after these pictures were taken, storm hit his life. One of those that wham out of nowhere. Didn't see it coming, no warning. Don't remember all of the details of the story, but he was jumping into the ocean, didn't hit the bottom. Somehow when he went in, he hit the water and broke his back. Short time after, this is Logan. Logan is paralyzed from the waist down. He has these hand protecting and things on his hand, mainly because doctors told him he would never even use his hands again. That's a storm. And in the midst of that storm, Logan had a decision to make. Is he going to wallow in self-pity? Is he going to boo-hoo? Or is he going to cling and turn to his faith and trust in God? How is he going to respond He chose to cry out to God and to cling to God. In the midst of his faith, he prayed and connected with God. He's serving God today. Teaches his Sunday school class. He says it's a great opportunity that God had given him a platform to encourage the next generation. He's praying with other men. There's a video of him on Facebook, where they said he would never use his hands, and he has a spoon in his hand, and he's feeding himself. The caption says, take this, Satan. How are you going to respond to storms? He would write this on his Facebook page. It says six years. It's been eight years, so this is like two years old. It says, if you were to tell me six years ago today, that I wasn't going to live my dream as a soldier in the army and instead be paralyzed from the waist down and roll as a college student and be a pretty good public speaker, I would have said you were crazy. I thank God. I thank God for putting me in a position that has negative impact but is more of a blessing. Looking forward to seeing what God has planned for me. Was this a protecting storm? Maybe God didn't want him to go into the military. Was this a perfecting storm? We don't know, but it's all for God's glory. In the midst of this storm, he's clinging to God, crying out to God, and he's being used for God's glory. Here's the question with this, though. When's this storm going to end? When's this storm going to end? Now, I can tell you, Logan's probably looking at this and saying, this is no longer a storm, this is my life. But the reality is, a storm came in and altered his life. When's it going to end? Here's where we come back to verse 18. 
in Matthew 8. What did Matthew 8, 18 say? Jesus gave a direction, an order, a commandment. We're going to the other side. We're going to the other side. And next week, we're going to pick up this story again in Matthew 8, 28. But I want to read Matthew 8, 28. It says this, And when he came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, when he came to the other side, the goal was to get to the other side. And these disciples in this storm got through it and got to the other side. Jesus is saying, come with me and you will make it to the other side. Logan's storm will end when he gets to the other side, when he gets to heaven. So I just want to pause and thank you, Logan, for giving me the permission to share your story as a testimony for God's grace, what God can do in someone's life fighting through storms. You're encouraging people and your story's being told in Arizona. I know you're watching from home. Thank you, my friend. We're praying for you. We're praying for you. And the reality is, your storm too will end. It will. It may not be till you get to the other side, but it will end when Christ calls us home and comes back for us. So the reality is, and there's his serving, he has served team, he serves at his church. You will make it to the other side. You will. You'll make it. Why? Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. When you cry out to God and cling to God, you will make it. Also, Peter wrote to a church that's being persecuted, going through trials and tribulations for their faith. And he writes this, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation when Jesus comes back or calls you home, it will result in praise to God. You might have heard this story. I love recounting it. It's uh, about going on an airplane. You ever been on an airplane? Many of you have been. You go on an airplane, and you have this flight. Let's say you're going to Hawaii. Would you rather have smooth sailing all the way to Hawaii and a crash landing? Or would you rather have some bumps along the way and a smooth landing? See, I'd rather have the smooth landing. What, what storms are you in today? Are you in a storm? See, you're either going into a storm, in a storm, coming out of a storm, or the storm on the horizon. One of those. And if you're in a storm today, don't be surprised. That's what James tells us in the book of James. Don't be surprised when you go through these things. Cry out to God. Cling to God. But we also as a church are committed to walking with people through the journey of faith. Don't leave God's people out of the equation. We need each other. We know there are storms. Don't walk it alone. Turn to God and to his people for comfort, for peace, for strength, for, for assurance, because you know what? We can come alongside you and say, you got this. And why can we say that with confidence? Because God's got this. So if God's got this, you got this. Allow brothers and sisters to join you in the journey of faith. Be vulnerable. Be, be open. To say, I'm going through a storm. I need help. I need prayer. Whatever it is, will you? And so if we close right now, brother, you can come up with the music. If you're going through a storm right now. Cry out to Jesus and allow his people to join you in the storm. And if you're going through a storm right now, will you have the courage to stand? Will you be willing to stand up and say, I'm going through a storm. I, I need prayer. I need to cling to Jesus. We have one person. Anybody else? There's another. Here we go. See, it takes one, and everybody's got the courage and boldness to stand up to say, you know what? I'm struggling. I'm going through things. I need to cling to Jesus. I need that hope and peace. I need God's people around me.
And whether you've stood or not, there's going to come a time when you are, if you would come to us, if you would come to somebody and pray. And so there are people here. Would you gather around them and pray with them? Will you please stand up as we close and as we sing? Will people come up and stand and come over and start praying with these people? We've got people up front over here. There's some in the back. Some in the back over here. We've got Matt and Laura. Somebody go over there and pray with them. And uh, we're just going to have this time. Let's pray now. We're going to sing. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you walk with us through the storms of life, that sometimes you stop them. But regardless, Lord, we're going to cling to you. We're going to trust in our brothers and sisters in faith that they're going to walk with us through it. Why, God? Because we know we got this, because you got this. We commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen.